My friend and I always used to walk through a wonderful, spacious park when we were younger. It was full of tall trees and it was very nicely maintained. In this large park there was an abandoned mansion. I can't really say how long it had been there, but on that day the front door of the mansion was wide open. The two of us decided to check out what was inside the place. As we inched through the door, the very first thing we noticed was that the mansion's floor was littered with crumpled up pieces of paper. We looked at each other and observed that there was no furniture, nothing except for those wrinkled balls of paper. The mansion had six rooms on its main floor, and every room we entered bore more and more scrunched up pieces of paper. We decided to open up one of the paper balls to see what was inside. Our curiosity got the better of us. I picked up a single wrinkled piece, and, as my friend picked up another, I unfolded my paper, smoothing out its bends and dents. At that moment it was almost as if a piece of rainbow emerged before our eyes, and I was suddenly standing next to a large window in one of those upstairs rooms of the house. I was looking outside into the large park. When I looked down at the piece of paper I held, it read, Look outside the large window that oversees the park in the upstairs parlour. I dropped the piece of paper and it fluttered gracefully to the ground. Meanwhile I stared at my open hands in a bout of horror. Dazed and utterly perplexed I found my way downstairs and met up with my friend. He was in the kitchen sitting at a round table that hadn't been there before. Where did that come from? I wondered. My friend stared at his open paper and reread the words several times before he looked at me and turned the page my way. It said, Go to the kitchen and sit at the round table. We stared at each other for a few moments, vaguely afraid, but then we began to chuckle. Within seconds we were laughing our heads off, marvelling at our newfound game. We could hardly believe what had happened. But being as young as we were, the mystery was endlessly exciting. We decided again to open another scrunched up piece of paper. As we opened up the crumpled papers on the floor, we experienced the same sudden flash of rainbow colours. But this time, I ended lying down in the field behind the mansion. When I peered onto the paper in my right hand, it read, Lie down in the field behind the mansion. I giggled uncontrollably. After a few minutes of running around the house, I found my friend collecting multiple balls of paper in his arms, eager to experience more of these strange, exciting phenomena. We both got the gist of what was happening at this point. We had no idea as to how it was possible, but we decided to have more fun with it. The supernatural always had a way of captivating our hearts. After a few more run-throughs with these strange mini-teleportation devices, I began to feel apprehensive. I wondered if, at one point, I would be placed somewhere I didn't want to be, or I'd be made to do something that I didn't enjoy. We continued though. Minute after minute we unfolded many papers and travelled through bedrooms, closets, trees. But then, after having been on the roof of the mansion, I stood before my friend, dead on the living room floor. I didn't scream. I couldn't. Murder him. I read on my crumpled page as I felt a surge of vomit and bile rising into my throat. Nothing came out but the sickness in my throat spread to my stomach, my head and my heart. I didn't know what to do. At this point, I began to scream and shout, praying to God for this to be a nightmare. I wanted it to go away. I wanted to rewind our day and be outside again, together, walking underneath the trees. All I could do was hide his body in a cupboard. I willed myself to be calm, and I hesitantly unfolded another paper in the hopes that the problem would correct itself. Once again I saw the colours of the rainbow, and I found myself standing behind a tree several metres away from the house. I could clearly see the front door. Within a few instants I saw both myself and my friend walk through that door. I began to wonder if I had died, or if I was having an out-of-body experience. I looked at the sheet in my hand and the only words scrawled upon it were, time will repeat itself and a paradox will take its place and it will be allowed. That gave me an idea. In my pocket remained the paper that made me kill my friend. Without looking at it, I crumpled it back up. 
Quietly I followed my other self who had separated from my friend as he explored the rooms of the house. As I crept behind him, he turned around very suddenly. Before he could utter a syllable, I forced the paper in front of my eyes and in a flash of rainbow colours I was able to kill my other self. The laws of time allowed me to take over my dead self's place in this world and also because of the fact that it was allowed to happen as it was written on the second piece of paper that I had on me. The laws of time allowed me to take over my dead self's place in this world and also because of the fact that it was allowed to happen as it was written on the second piece of paper that I had on me, which reversed time. It must have control over time and paradoxes, which made me now the new alive and present of my other dead self. I hid my limp, bleeding other dead self in a cupboard in the upstairs bathroom to rot. To my great relief I heard my friend call my name from downstairs. My friend who managed to stay alive and well. My best friend. When I went downstairs he greeted me excitedly, smiling childishly and being blissfully unaware of the situation. I pretended that nothing had happened. In a heartbeat I told him that the house creeped me out and that it would be much better if we left. After that day we never went near the mansion again. I don't know if anyone saw or heard about anything that happened between us, but I recently heard from another friend that the house had been demolished, and I can tell you with great certainty that while this news is a relief, I dreaded the probable prospect that my corpse was uncovered in the bathroom cabinet. When I was about 14, I had to visit my grandma's house while my mum was in the hospital. My dad had to stay with my mum, so I had to stay with my grandmother. I never really liked staying with my grandmother, because she wouldn't let me go outside alone. I never really understood why. She would never tell me. The first night I stayed with her, everything seemed normal. She had weird cat statues around the house, as she owned two cats. My grandpa's photos were above the fireplace and the smell of old candy and mothballs hung in the air. My grandmother told me I would be staying in the guest bedroom as normal. We got there late, had dinner, then I went to bed. The second day my grandmother made us potato pancakes and bacon. She told me I could play around the house as long as I don't wander off into the woods nearby. I told her okay and walked outside. It felt a little weird because, like I said before, she didn't normally let me play outside by myself. I was walking around her house thinking about what I could do when I noticed the tree next to her house. It was a weeping willow that was halfway between her house and the woods. Tied to one of the branches was an old-looking swing. It was giving me a creepy vibe, so I went inside. I decided to read a little until it was time for lunch. When lunch came around, I asked my grandmother about the swing, and she stared at me. What about it? She would ask me. And I told her the last time I was here, it wasn't there. She kept saying it was always there. The rest of the day was spent playing cards with my grandmother. That night I looked out of my window at the willow tree. It seemed creepy. Really creepy. The next day I ate breakfast, played poker with my grandma, and went outside. I would scare my grandma's chickens, get milk from her cow and I fed her horse butter. I was getting a little tired but heard singing coming from the woods. I looked at the woods to see some white fabric attached to a bush. I looked at my grandma's house to see if she was watching me. I didn't see her and being the dumb teenager I was I grabbed the fabric. It looked pretty old and there were red spots on it. Not like normal spots though. It looked like someone got a red marker and had let the dye bleed through the fabric. That night I looked at the woods from the guest bedroom. That night I looked at the woods from the guest room window. Something didn't seem right about it. Both the woods and the farmhouse didn't seem right. I noticed something walk out of the woods after a few hours. The clock in the room stopped ticking. I wasn't really worried about the clock because it was old and has stopped before, but the thing in the woods... Well, less of a thing, more of a girl. I looked around the room and looked through the closet to find my grandfather's old army binoculars that I found on the first night I stayed. 
I looked back outside with the binoculars to see that the girl was actually a lady in a white dress, and she was sitting on the willow swing. She had an eerie look about her. After a while, I fell asleep. The next morning, I mentioned the lady in the fabric I'd found to my grandmother. She stared at me. She accused me of lying until I showed the fabric to her. She left the kitchen and came back with an old book. It turned out it was an old photo album that the previous owners of the house had left there. I asked why she was showing it to me. I asked why she was showing it to me, but she just showed me a picture of a lady. She had blonde hair and pale blue eyes. She looked identical to the lady from the night before. My grandmother then explained the house used to belong to a married couple and their twin teenage daughters, Larissa and Jessica. Larissa fell in love with a man that lived in town and they planned on running away and getting married. Her father found out that they were going to meet up in the woods, so he went out a few hours before Larissa, killed the man she loved and went back home. Larissa waited around until midnight for the man she loved at the willow tree, but he never showed up. She was so heartbroken, she ran into the woods in her white dress and was never seen alive again. Now every time I visit my grandmother, I look out to the woods and say hi to Larissa. This is a true story. As a child, my family and I lived in a two-bedroom house forcing my older sister and I to share a bedroom, which wasn't too big a deal. With us being kids and wanting something new constantly, rather than asking for toys, we would rearrange our bedroom. Our room was at the very end of the hallway and there was no door on the door frame, meaning that when standing in the hallway you could see right into my room, and from my room you could see right down the hallway and into a small extra living room area we had. The house always gave me an eerie feeling, not like I was being watched, but I definitely could feel that I wasn't ever alone. I remember on many occasions looking down the hallway and seeing a shadow-like ghostly figure move from the left side of the room to the right, and then back. It was very defined, as in you could see the arms swing and the legs walk. It always freaked me out, but I did my best to convince myself I was making things up in my head. One day my sister and I decide to rearrange our rooms and my bed goes where I can no longer see down the hallway, but you could see down it from where we moved her bed. Less than a week later she asks me to move the beds back and says she doesn't like being able to see into the hallway. For years I continued to see him walking in my house at night, but he never bothered me. He seemed friendly. When I was about ten my sister finally asked me, Do you see him too? and just the saying, him, I knew exactly who she meant. We both decided from there forward his name would be him. Sometimes rather than walking back and forth, he walked right down the hallway directly towards me, and that was pretty scary, but he would always disappear just before walking into my room. One night I went to get a drink of water, and in the kitchen I feel like I'm being watched, and I knew who it was watching me. I then become scared from some odd reason. I called out, Are you going to hurt me? And in my ear I hear a whisper, You're safe, child. And since then I have never feared him. I have a vague memory of my mum telling me the previous owner died in the house, but that might have just been to scare me. Still creepy to think about it, though. Edit. I asked my sister if she still remembered him, because I wanted to make sure I wasn't making this up in my head. I asked her, You remember the ghost at Dad's house too, right? And her response was, Him. So over ten years we both remember him very well. It was about 3am and I was feeling tired enough to finally go to bed. For me, if I am not tired enough to the point where I actually want to go to sleep and not play games anymore, then it is hard for me to go to sleep, so I usually end up staying up all night. Never once have I ever encountered something like this. Two things like this have happened before, but I'll save them for later. On to my story. 
Whenever I go to sleep, I usually go to Netflix and put on an episode of Family Guy, as it comforts me to hear something funny and familiar in the background, until it finishes, and then, silence. As I put on Family Guy, I looked at my dog, Chubbers. He's staring at the centre of my door, which means whilst laying in my bed, I was facing directly toward it. So my dog is staring at my door. His ears are alert and I hear him growling a little. I look over and since it was around what they call the devil's hour, I got a bit creeped out and asked Chubbs to stop as he was creeping me out. I ordered him to go under the blanket and sleep. I pulled him aside me since I like to have him close to me or in my room on my bed. Not because I'm scared, but because he has always slept by me since he was old enough and big enough to sleep beside a human and because I worry about him after his mother was put down. But yeah, as I lay down, I am at the edge of my bed by my nightstand with my face facing the door where Chubbers had been previously staring. As I close my eyes, I suddenly hear a whisper, and whatever it was, it had whispered my name. It sounded like a female, a young female, somewhere around my age. I can't remember it clearly, but it sounded young. I shot up faster than a sonic racing rainbow dash and backed the hell up grabbing Chubbers and still staring at my door. I don't know how long I stared but when I looked it was somewhere around 3.30am. I was scared shitless. I sat up against the wall while holding Chubbers and tried to go to sleep, forcing myself to think about good things like my friends, Zoe and Padme, or Chubbers brothers. Eventually I went to sleep, but I'll never forget that night. I swear I wasn't dreaming, and I didn't make this up. I wasn't high or hallucinating either. I don't know any other way to prove it, but now I wish I'd recorded it. If it ever happens again, I'm definitely recording it. But I hope it never does. I had to go back. It had been playing on my mind for the better part of three decades. I had tried to forget most of my time there on the farm. They were mostly horrible memories, but bits and pieces of those horrible memories kept finding their way back to me as I grew older, and they left behind a question I needed answered. Could such terrible things exist in this world? I pulled into the dirt driveway that led to the house that had long since been abandoned. The two-story farmhouse sat on a small hill, dark and wistful. As I approached up the winding dirt driveway, I could see the dirt rotting wood and broken shutters hanging open from dark windows. That had been my home in the 1980s. I grew up there. I had left when I was nine. It was a small farm, only one cornfield, small enough that my father could work it alone with some leased machinery. Though the land was small, he made a good amount of money from it. The farm was different, strange. The land's ripe for growing, Dad had said to me once. He pulled a scarecrow from the equipment shed that sat next to the cornfield. There were four scarecrows, and Dad would set them up just after the field was sowed in growing season. They would always go up in a diamond pattern. First one he would hammer in at the north end of the field, second one to the west end third one to the east end, and fourth one to the south. I had always wondered why he didn't hammer in the west end scarecrow last. It was closest to the house, but things had their order on that farm. You see, Dad said, it's special land, real special. Yields are off the charts for the size of the field. Stop chucking that football about and listen up, Timmy. I did what he said and followed behind him closely as he dragged the scarecrow to the south end of the field. The butt of the scarecrow's stake dragged through the dirt, kicking up dust. I listened carefully to Dad. When he told you something, he only spoke kindly once, if he had to tell you twice. This is going to be your farm one day, Dad said. He drove the scarecrow's stake into the ground. So, soon, not this harvest season but maybe the next, I'm going to start teaching you of how things work round here, little by little. He then hammered the top of the stake that ran up the back of the scarecrow like a spine. I flinched at each of the four cracking shots. 
When he was done, he wiped the sweat off his brow and turned to me, his brooding figure silhouetted by the low afternoon sun. This land's good, Timmy, real good, he smiled, with a twinge of a wild look in his eye. You just need the right fertilizer. With that, he started back towards the house. I stood there for a moment, staring up at the scarecrow, its featureless straw face framed by a hood fashioned out of a ragged burlap sack. Stray strands of straw poking from its head fluttered in the gentle breeze. Something in my stomach churned over. I never did like those things. I popped the trunk of my rental car, pulled out a shovel, then closed the trunk again. I looked out over the field. It was barren now, the soil untouched for decades. The equipment shed was far to my right, on the east side of the field. It was as decrepit as the house. The roof had partially caved in, and the wall planks were warped in places. An iron chain fastened by two heavy-duty padlocks locked the doors. I swallowed hard. I prayed they were not in there. I started toward the farmhouse. The pylons were still out. On afternoons in the growing season, when the scarecrows were in the field, and just as the sun turned orange and started its descent to the horizon, Dad would hammer in ten four-foot wooden pylons around the house and then take them down first thing in the morning. Each pylon had carvings on them, strange symbols that looked similar to what you would see on a totem pole. What are those? I asked once. I'll tell you one day. You're not ready to know yet. When the pylons and scarecrows were out, Dad had a strict rule. I had to come inside when the bottom of the sun touched the horizon. One afternoon I had spent too long playing outside. The sun was a big orange semicircle peeking over the horizon line, but I didn't care that day. I was having too much fun and was feeling a tad rebellious. So I played. I was chucking Hail Mary passes to myself down the driveway. In my head I was the star QB of my favourite team, the New England Patriots. I always wanted to be like Dan Marino and even though he was a Dolphin player and a division rival, he was still my favourite player. The high-flying, gunslinging star QB that could chuck the ball 80 yards through the air. Yeah, that was me in my dreams. But reality was I never had the talent for the game, unfortunately. But that afternoon for a short while, with the rambunctious imagination of a nine-year-old, I was king. I heaved the ball in the air and took off underneath it. Timmy Brentwood throws the pass high and long, I shouted. I watched the wobbly spiral descend and at full sprint I stuck up my hands, bobbled the ball and then caught it. He's got it. He's at the ten. The five. Touchdown Patriots. I spiked the ball into the dirt. Timothy Brentwood throws the last second winning touchdown pass in the Super Bowl. The greatest quarterback to ever. Timmy, my father said sternly from the porch. Reality came crashing back. What's the rule? Inside before sundown. Get a move on. Anger suddenly burned at the base of my chest. He was always ordering me around. I was always doing what he wanted. Always had to listen to him. He never listened to me. I was always meek and good and followed his orders. I never got what I wanted, so he could get screwed as far as I was concerned. Just this once I wanted to play. No, I don't want to, I said, with all the misplaced confidence of a rebellious child. I want to keep playing. Dad stopped down the porch steps with purpose. He spoke through gritted teeth, his veins and tendons bulging from his neck. If I have to go out there and get you, boy. My heart froze. The confidence and anger melted away as quickly as it came. I was only scared now. I started back to the house running past the pylons that Dad had erected earlier in the afternoon. At the base of the porch steps he grabbed me by my wrist and hauled me up them without my feet touching the wood. He put me back down on the porch and grasped my shoulders tightly. He dropped his face to mine, his piercing gaze flaring with a ferocious intensity. You listen to me when I tell you to do something, boy. Then I got a hard clip over the ear. My ear went numb and rung with a high-pitched whir. My eyes swelled with tears. I looked at him, stunned. It was not the first time I had been hit, but it was the first time I had been hit over the head. Now go to bed, 
right now, without supper. Without saying anything, I ran inside, up the steps, slammed my door and curled under the covers. I buried my face into the pillow, and only then did I sob. I walked past the pylons that had remained for all these years. Some still good, others had toppled over. They were old now, blackened with mould and weathered. The wood split and the carvings faded. I walked up the porch steps that moaned their old age. For a moment I stood at the front door, tears stinging the back of my eyes. It was not the house I had come back for. It was what was in the field I needed to see, but it was the home I wanted to see, because through the bad memories there was still some good. The hinges whined as I pushed the door open. The house was as I remembered, untouched from the last dreadful night I spent here all those years ago, the night we had to flee. Only now the home was caked with dust and mould. Cobwebs had collected in the corners. The wallpaper had peeled in large sheets off the wall. All these artefacts of neglect and abandonment. The TV was still there, greyed with thick dust. Tears streamed down my face as I stood in the living room, the furniture standing around me like ruins. Every Sunday morning we would sit together there. I got to watch Looney Tunes on the TV as Dad would sit in his recliner reading the paper or a book and Mum would make us her famous pancakes. No one could or ever will make them like Mum could. They were thick and fluffy, served with a generous drenching of maple syrup. If we were especially lucky, she would add chocolate chips to the batter and serve with a dollop of ice cream. That was the best. When she was done cooking, she would come through from the kitchen with two plates stacked high with pancakes. She would give one to Dad with a kiss and one to me with my own peck on the cheek. Then she would get her plate and join us in the living room. I would cuddle up next to her on the sofa and we would sit together to enjoy her pancakes and watch cartoons. It was the one time during the week that everything didn't feel so cold. The one time Dad didn't feel so distant. The one time I was not scared of him. The one time he would actually have a conversation with Mum and me instead of talking in short and simple bursts of barking out orders. The one time we were a real family. I wiped my tears with my sleeve and walked outside, leaving the home behind for the last time. I waded out into the field, the soil hard beneath my boots. I could feel the field spirit. With some satisfaction I felt it was weak. Dad had called it special. I would call it evil. The night Dad had sent me to bed with a clip over the ear and no supper. Mum had come up with some soup and a glass of soda. She handed it to me with a kiss on the forehead. A mother can't let her child go hungry, she said. It goes against all my nature. Thanks, Mummy. I know he's rough, Timmy, but try not to get too mad at him. He worries for you, that's all. I don't care, I hate him. She sighed and looked away, then ruffled my hair and gave me a smile. He does what he can to provide. Just leave the bowl and glass on the nightstand. I'll come in later and take it to the kitchen. She got up and walked to the door, pausing to say, I love you. Love you too, Mommy, I said, and she left the room. Later in the night, I had awoken suddenly. I sat bolt upright. My football! I had left it outside that afternoon. It was my only ball and it was just sitting out there, plain as day down the driveway. If one of the older kids, the neighbours from a few miles down the road, saw it the next morning, they would surely steal it if they had not already, and if they stole it, Dad would not buy me another. I could already hear his lecture in my head. Let it be a lesson learned. If you don't take care of your things, they won't take care of you, he would always say. I creeped to my door, eased it open, and peeked around the corner to my parents' room down the hall. The door was shut and the house dark and quiet. Perfect. I crept down the stairs and tiptoed to the kitchen where Dad kept the front door keys in one of the drawers. I grabbed them, and then, dipping in and out of the moonlight that flooded through the windows, I tiptoed to the front door. I eased back the deadbolts as slowly and quietly as I could. They drew back with a faint click. I waited nervously after each one clicked back, listening for my parents' door to fly open, with my father's heavy footsteps tumbling out like a madman. But they never came. I opened the door and stepped out onto the porch. My ball sat fifteen yards away, looking lonely in the driveway. I was prepared to make a mad dash for it, run over, pick it up, run back, lock the doors, 
sneak back upstairs and go to bed. Dad would be none the wiser. But before I could take off down the driveway, I was distracted by a rustling noise coming from the cornfield to my left. The corn stalks were about six foot by then, and shining a pale green under the moonlight. A man's muffled scream came from the corn. My heart leaped. The corn was restless. The stalks rustled back and forth in the centre of the field, and then came another muffled scream. I froze and my knees became watery. The scarecrows. They were not in their usual spots. They were close together in the centre of the cornfield, their hooded heads poking out over the top of the stalks. And they were moving. The corn rustled violently as did the scarecrows. They moved about wildly as if they were wrestling with something. Another muffled scream. I watched on wide-eyed and frozen with terror as the scarecrows fought with something among the corn stalks. I thought that this was surely a bad dream, a terrible dream, a nightmare. And, in a sense, it was a nightmare, just not the kind you can wake up from. The muffled scream cut off abruptly. The scarecrows froze for a moment, their hoods ruffling gently in the breeze. They craned their heads and their straw faces featureless but somehow ingrained with hatred settled on me. I was seeing something I should not be seeing. A shiver trickled down my spine. Somewhere in the distance a crow called. I was just about to scream when a hand grasped the back of my pyjama collar and pulled me backwards into the house. I was flung to the ground by my dad. He stepped around me and slammed the door shut, then locked the two deadbolts. They drew shut with an emphatic shunk. I waited for Dad to turn around with a look of rage, but what I saw scared me worse. He had looked at me, not with rage, but terror. It was the first time I had seen him scared, and I would see him this scared only once more, just a few weeks later. I started to cry. Seeing him scared had scared me more than his rage ever could have. It's okay, he said shakily. You're okay, Timmy. He bent down and scooped me up. He carried me to my room as I cried and he tucked me into bed, saying one thing repeatedly. You're okay, Timmy. You're okay. A murder of crows flew overhead, moving strangely silent. I stood in the middle of the field, the once rich soil, now sick. Up close I could see it had taken on a greyish hue, and there was something else too. It was rumbling slightly as if it were hungry. I readied my shovel and paused. I asked myself, do I really want to do this? What purpose did it serve? What would it change? Nothing. So why had I come back? Closure, that was why. I couldn't move on if I didn't have closure, nor could I heal. The nightmares would continue, the anxiety would persist, and my soul would continue to whittle and seep from wounds that wandering fingers of doubt kept prodding open. I had to see if it was all real. I couldn't let questions linger. Could such horror exist in this world, or were my memories simply warped and exaggerated with time? So did I want to do this? Yes. The answer was always yes. I should have come back years ago. Maybe then I would not have suffered so long. Closure. That's what I needed. I pierced the soil with my shovel. My door had burst open in the middle of the night. Dad was in the doorway a rifle slung over his shoulder. We need to go, he said. I sat up groggily. What? We need to go. He pulled me out from under the blanket. What's going on, Dad? We need to go. Why? He pulled me along at his side as we rushed down the stairs, his deep wrinkles and tanned skin, his strong jaw and sunken eyes, his pointed nose and thin lips, all twisted in an expression of terror terror like what had plastered his face the night he had caught me outside after dark, only worse. I started to cry. Dad, where's Mum? I thought I did everything right, he said absently. I don't know what I did wrong. The pylons, maybe? The front door was already hanging open when he dragged me through it. Outside, the corn was restless again. I don't know what I did wrong, Dad said. I don't know how I didn't hear them come in. Dad dragged me to the pickup truck in the driveway. A woman's muffled screams came from the corn. I looked over my shoulder towards the field to see the hooded heads bobbing around wildly again. 
Dad, where's Mum? I said with increasing urgency. I thought I did everything right. I don't know why it went wrong. He opened the pickup's passenger door and threw me inside. Dad, where is Mum? I screamed. He shut the door in my face. He walked around the front of the pickup and for a moment he paused to look back at the field and at the scarecrows. The shotgun trembled in his hands. For what it's worth, I think he would have tried to save her if it was not for me. He continued around the car and climbed into the front seat. He fumbled with the keys in his trembling hands before inserting and turning them. The engine rumbled to life. Dad, tell me, where's Mum? He reversed suddenly, swinging the car around so the front end pointed down the driveway, away from the house. He slammed the stick into first gear and took off with a lurch. The dirt clattered the underneath of the truck as we went. Where's Mum? I cried shrilly. He began to sob. I'm sorry. I don't know what I did. I thought I did everything right. I'm sorry, Tim. I'm sorry. Sarah. I'm sorry, Sarah. Oh, God, Sarah, I'm so sorry. I cowered back into my seat, feeling the car bounce over the bumpy road as we fled. My father cried, and so did I as we drove off into the night, leaving the farm and mum behind. I tossed aside the first clump of soil. Underneath the topsoil, the dirt was grey and pale as a bone. I continued to dig, tossing the soil in a heap to the side where it trembled subtly. Then I hit something with a hollow thud. I threw away the shovel and got to my knees. I reached into the hole and brushed aside the dirt. I uncovered what I expected, yet feared at the same time. A human skull. I plucked it from the dirt and held it up with shaking hands. The hollow eye socket stared vacantly back at me. I put it aside and reached into the hole again. I clawed at the dirt frantically with my bare hands. There were more bones, skulls, hands, femurs. I poured and poured at the dirt. I dug until my fingernails were torn clean off. It was true. It was all true. There is evil in this world. My memories hadn't lied. I fell back on my ass, exhausted, terrified, despaired. A pile had formed around me. So many skulls, so many bones. All from the souls that had fed the soil. Hey fearsome friends, I apologise again for being absent, I had a friend's wedding to attend to but I'm back now and have many chilling stories to tell you. Also don't forget to check out my Patreon page for exclusive content, all details are in the description below. Please like, share and subscribe and remember, keep being creepy.